is a huge national tragedy. The number of people killed because that tragedy included a nuclear power plant accident, the nuclear part of that 20,000 is zero. Okay, so that's the first thing to remember. It was beyond design basis in terms of the earthquake and beyond design basis in terms of the tsunami wave that came in afterwards. I've been to that part of the Japanese coast. It's very rocky. Everything in Japan is subject to earthquakes. It was an extremely severe event. They have, they had, unfortunately, the diesel generators that are in the bottom, but they made a plot, they had a mistake in their emergency planning. And it was a blind spot. And we've done this in the United States in a city called New Orleans, where my daughter used to live. The mistake was that you assume that when bad natural disaster occurs, that the guys on the white horses are going to ride in and help you in a short period of time. When 20,000 people all up and down Japan have been killed, communications out, roads are out, everything's a mess, the guys on the, right, on the white horses didn't arrive real fast. So they didn't have anything to replace the emergency generators that were flooded. In New Orleans, the best example of this is the aquarium. They had a very detailed plan of how to deal with flooding from a hurricane. They would turn on their diesel generators. And by eight hours after the event, they'd get more fuel from off-site. When Hurricane Katrina came through, everything worked fine for the first eight hours. Turns out aquarium, all the animals, all the various fish and mammals in water require oxygenation of the water. Eight hours after Katrina flooded the city, the diesel generator stopped, the oxygenation of the water stopped, and every animal in the aquarium died. It was a great plan, provided there was someone on a white horse to come in and protect. So that wasn't a design problem, that was an assumption of what was going to happen outside the plant. And they got bit by it. But, but the point was, they, they knew, I mean, there was information that there, where they cited their needs of generators would be enough. Yes, and why they, why they didn't do it, I, I don't have the answer there. Because I simply that's don't the know. Thing that, that causes people to fear because they obviously, I don't think, did it on purpose. So you're left with just knowing that humans are stupid. Well, most of my career I've been a safety engineer. And the average designer is focused on how to make something work. They're really, really good at it. They're doing their damnedest to make some facility, some equipment work. And then a clown like me comes in and says, now how's it going to fail? And you know how popular that is? You imagine walking into a design review and know that everyone in the room wants to kill you? <laughs> I've had that experience. It's, it's a mindset. You have to get into a paranoid mindset that says, the world's going to get me, nature's going to get me, mother nature's a bitch, the guy who put the cap on some tank is going to screw up. You have to think paranoid. And if you don't, sooner or later it'll bite you. Up here. Bob. I appreciate you uh, informing us about this. But I think it leads to a real problem that we face in our country with the next generation. And that is, there's a real trend to walk away from science based yeah. uh, decision making. And uh, so, how would you propose that? next generation's uh, belief in science-based decision-making is uh, a worthwhile and a good way to go. So the Fukushima question, was it tough enough? <laughs> 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 I mean, I, I skated by that well enough that now, now you've got to throw that zinger at me? <laughs> uh, I wish I had an answer. Maybe John has.
Yeah, I've read, I've read that article. The, the issue of National Geographic you may come across is, I don't remember the exact title, is basically and, and the war on science, thank you. Which is, you know, essentially what you said. I don't have an answer. And how you take, I mean, this is a complicated subject. I thank the audience for, for sitting through this. This is not a 30 second sound bite. I mean, it's not just technology. All decisions now are made by not even 30 second sound bites, 10, 5. You can't deal with complex problems in a rational way with 5 and 10 second sound bites, whether it's technology or not. I don't, I don't have an answer. John. That's why I'm here. <laughs> we can do better than we are, and we're on a path where we're just going to do the same old, same old thing. Well, part of speaking out, I'm a nuclear engineer also, and part of the speaking out is what is the relative hazard now compared to when it began? What is the relative hazard, for example, of the chemicals in our environment? the electricity in our environment, the nuclear power in our environment, the gasoline cars in our environment, compared to getting our power from coal, nuclear. This is a relative thing. People don't realize how many people are killed by electricity every year, and everyone in this room has electricity within inches of your body every day, and it can kill you. Now yes. Thousands die every year. I have to give you a realistic and therefore pessimistic response. Before I retired, uh, we got some money, uh, Jim Lake and Harold Blackman, who at the time were managers at the INL, or whatever acronym it had at that time. We got some money from the Department of Energy and we did a study of stakeholders. This was back when we thought seriously that we'd have a next generation nuclear plant here in Idaho. So we conducted some experiments and I worked with folks, social science, political science folks at Boise State. And one of the experiments we did was we tested the sort of thing you're talking about and different ways of interacting with the public. So we did surveys before an event that was on the Boise campus uh, on a Saturday, afterwards, and so forth, and what way of communicating had an effect? No. Nope. And in fact, Boise State, uh, about a year earlier, uh, as one of their annual studies, they, they, the, the political science group there, does a survey of Idahoans on topics of the day. That particular year, they had done a survey and they asked, it was about 20 words, and unfortunately I don't have it in my head, asked, what do you think about having a new nuclear plant at the INL? Uh, again, I don't, don't quote me because I don't have the exact words. Now, there was no other information. Only a few people knew this was under consideration. So, what, in a, theor in a theoretical sense, what you should have seen statewide is, I don't know enough. Uh-uh. A third said, yep, let's do it. I don't know what it is, but I like it. A third said, I don't know what it is, but I hate it. And only a third said, I don't know. Okay, people have their minds made up on a lot of these things. It is not easy to change opinions once they are formed. The social science is extremely clear on that point. It takes continual effort and something that changes the game. That's why, by the way, there's even social science that, that's behind the fact that everyone goes out and says new and improved, whatever the product is. It's amazing what the social science will tell you. And I, I'm saying this as a nuclear engineer. I didn't know all this stuff was out there until about 10 years ago. Changing the game along these lines has a chance of resetting public opinion, at least with some fraction of the population. 
There have been studies, I believe it was Oklahoma State, uh, uh, a guy there studied, did, went out and did some tests, and sure enough, the public wants to recycle used fuel. Let's give it to him, John. And I don't know how long you want to go. Yep. The two exact people have studied that. Sweden and Finland have so far been successful with a consensus based approach. They have a relatively small country, relatively small population, and a relatively homogeneous population. Education is probably higher. I don't know the numbers, so that's, I mean, I can't vouch for that. We have a very geographically, politically diverse country. When you read through what happened in the 80s, where each type of geology is prevalent in a certain part of the United States, so this idea that everything's on the table, I mean, whether we like it or not, politicians can figure some of this stuff out. So what they do, and it was very clear what happened, the written word, written language is pretty clear once you read thousands of pages of documents, if I don't want it in my constituent's backyard, I just find a way to rig the game so that that geology isn't part of the study. It's real simple. That doesn't work so well in a country like Sweden or Finland. There's not as much variety, not just politically, but also geologically. I, don't, I, I, wish, I, I wish I could stand up here and say I know the solution. I think I know some parts of the solution but I think I cannot claim that I know it'll work. But I do, I can claim that what we're trying now is just a rehash. How does what you're saying relate to the present nuclear uh, test ban with Iran? I don't know enough about what's going on behind the scenes there to speak intelligently about the Iranian situation. One or two things I'll, I'll say is that there are reports they agreed this week to sign the additional protocols. If true, if implemented, that would be a good sign. But the IAEA it said, itself said last week they can't verify claims that Iran's already made about their program. 